So welcome to the Oxford City Council Landlord Forum. Um, we're pleased to have lots of you here today and we're also pleased to have some speakers. So we've got, um, this is the agenda for the day. Um, we've got Councillor Linda Smith to give a welcome. We'll then have a session on electrical safety, a short break, and then move into the housing health and safety rating system and on licensing. So what I will do is I will hand over to Councillor Linda. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, so welcome everybody and thank you for attending our online meeting of the Landlord Forum today. And it's really fantastic that there's been so much interest in the session today. So um, you know, well done to the officers for organising and thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, effective two-way communication and partnership with local landlords like yourselves uh, is absolutely critical for this council to achieve our aims of improving housing in Oxford and addressing the housing needs of Oxford people. Um, and that's because, as you may know, Oxford has up to 50% of its housing stock being lived in by private renters. And despite the fact that we're doing all we can, um, Oxford City Council currently has the biggest council house building programme that we've seen for decades. Uh, know that the private rented sector will continue to provide the best chance of a decent home for many of our Oxford residents. And that's why this council will need to continue to pro provide appropriate support to both landlords and tenants uh, to support access to private rented sector homes for people on a low income. So schemes like the Home Choice Scheme, uh, which some of you may already be involved in, which offers landlords like yourselves zero fees, rent in advance, guaranteed deposits, access to legal advice and tenancy support if needed, in return for housing local families facing homelessness put forward by our council. And we are always looking for more la landlords to join that scheme. Um, so please get in touch with our housing needs team if you are interested in participating in that. Um, we're also continuing to lobby the government on the need to raise local authority housing rates uh, so that people on benefits have access to a wider pool uh, of your properties um, for, them to, for them to rent uh, in expensive cities like ours. And I know that improving the safety of privately rented homes in the city is a priority shared by this council and the majority of landlords uh, in this city. And that's why we've put the sessions on today about electrical safety and the housing health and safety rating system directly in response to requests for more information from members of this forum. And I know that we've already had uh, a, an idea put forward today for um, a future session at our next meeting. Um, so please keep those coming too if, if there are things that you would like on the agenda for uh, a future meeting of this forum. So I hope you'll find these sessions informative and that they will help you ensure your property is providing a safe home for your tenants. Um, the final session we've got on today is about our new selective licensing scheme. I think we can still call it new. Um, the decision to bring this in was a big policy decision for this council, which we didn't take lightly. Um, we took it to build on the success of our HMO licensing scheme and to improve standards. And when designing the scheme, it was important for us that the scheme was set up to favour responsible landlords like yourselves. Um, so there was a generous early bird discount for landlords who applied on time. Uh, there's a substantial discount for accredited la landlords. And I hope that you will be seeing the benefit of the scheme um, as we uh, use it to stop rogue landlords from operating in the city um, and uh, use it to stop your business being undercut by bad landlords who don't maintain their properties to a safe standard. So I'm sure today's session will be a really useful opportunity to, to discuss how the rollout of that scheme is going and to answer any questions um, from participants about how it's operating. So finally, yeah, I'd just like to emphasize, you know, that the massive role you will have in being part of the solution to Oxford's housing crisis and how both myself and all the council officers working in this area, I know, really want to work in partnership with you to improve conditions for renters in Oxford. Um, and if you've got any ideas for how we can improve on how we do that, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. I'd be very pleased to hear from you. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming and giving up your time today to be part of this forum. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you, Linda. Um, so we will hand over to Ian for the first session. Um, think to share his screen. I think that's okay, is it now? See my, my screen? Yep. Great. You, you had me panic slightly when you said talk for an hour and I saw the hour down. I'm sure we already said half an hour, but you know, mate, you'll have to try and stop me when I get do waffle on too much, won't you? So just pull the reins in whenever you want to, Catherine. All right. So morning, everybody. Land Law Forum um, used to do a lot of these on a, a yearly basis with the, um, well, in the past with the NL, NLA and the NRLA. And as Catherine said, I still do CIH local authority training all over the country and landlord training as well and on pat testing training. So throw anything you want at me today. Um, hopefully I'm going to show you a few funny things, a few serious things as well to, to talk about you know, electrical safety in the private rental sector, you'll be quite surprised by how dangerous electricity is uh, when you see some of the things I'm going to show you as well. And I'll pre-warn you for about a couple of photos I'm going to show you before they do pop up as well. So we had new regulations that came in way back in 2020. They've been on the cards and talked about and, and discussed at government level for a number of years prior to this as well. Hopefully you're all familiar, uh, especially if you're in HMO, that you had to have an EICR in place on your old HMO properties. And you know now that from the 1st of April 2021, which is you know over two years ago, you should now have an EICR in place on all your new properties as well. Um, there are a few things when you get into some of the nitty gritty detail about it around what is a qualified person it talks about within the regulations and what type of person should be carrying out this type of work and, and to what level should they be carrying out to. And it talks about the 18th edition. And we'll talk some regulatory stuff a little bit as we go through, because the regulations are constantly changing and they've changed again from September last year. So but we'll talk about who do you want doing this work to start off with? That's probably the critical one. And it's one that most local authorities I get questioned over around. I've had this report. What do you think about this report? Because I tend to get a lot of reports sent to me and it's like a lot of the time the issues will be pushed back onto you as landlords if you're using non-registered electricians and if you're generally using people who aren't registered within the competent person scheme who are all these people to do and carry out EICRs so not every electrician you come across and that's why I've got the question there not every electrician you come across is qualified to do EICRs so you need to ask the qualification ask the question are they qualified to do EICRs? Because there's different levels of electricians out there. So I'll give you a couple of good examples and some things that you've may have experienced recently. If you've ever had solar PV installed in your house, it's another level of um, over the basic level of electrician. So there's additional qualifications there. And if you've had this installed recently, electric vehicle, there is an electric vehicle qualification to say, I'm qualified to install electric vehicle charge points. So each electrician is not all the same. And there is a, a difference in, in respect to You've got domestic electricians, which most of the properties that you've got will be classed as domestic into commercial and industrial electricians as well. So you can see there's a scope there. Now, if you're using somebody as a member of a competent person scheme, they get assessed on a yearly basis as well. And they're assessed to those levels on a on a, not an annual, an annual basis. So they'll get assessed in different ways on different. Levels. So not every electrician is the same is basically what I'm saying. But. There are things you might be surprised to hear that you are allowed to do for yourself. Now, it always comes down to as long as you feel comfortable, as long as you're competent, you do it. And as long as you know that you are switching electricity off. And if you're not sure about that, then really you shouldn't be doing any electrical work. So technically, you are allowed to do like for like. So somebody attends damage, this, let's say a socket fascia in your property, they put a crack on it. If you had an EICR report, it would fail straight away. So you get an unsatisfactory report. But as long as you know that you've switched it up, switched this off, then basically you're undoing a few cables and you're reattaching onto an existing outlet as well. So like for like is allowed. Okay. Um, say like if the screw is missing, that type of thing, you're allowed to do certain basic things, but you're what you're not allowed to do is alter or extend cables. As soon as you do that, you're into all the wiring regulations that come along, all the guidance that comes along with the wiring regulations as well. And then you're into certification as well. So ideally, use somebody that's a member of a competent person scheme. So 
just I'm going to show you one website now that I always talk to local authorities about. So you've got this one here, which is registered competent person in electrical. I've put the Oxford City Council postcode in. I've pressed the search on it and it lists all the electricians, but not as you can see here, not every electrician can do EICR. So if you want to find somebody that can do, you, you tick to undertake electrical safety report, you refresh the search again, and it then lifts, lists everybody within that generic postcode area. And it extends across the whole of the country, this, who is competent to carry out EICRs and who has been assessed by their competent person scheme to do EICRs, which is probably the critical one. Because they all might all claim that they can do it, which it technically could be true, but if they're not being assessed by their competent person scheme, that's your guess rather than a competent person scheme saying, yes, they are qualified. So it's worth bearing that in mind when you are using different electricians across the country. So as I said, they're all your competent person schemes. Uh, select, you won't be interested in because it's Scotland only. And the main two you're going to deal with, as you can see from that search, will be an NIC member or a NAPIT member as well. So... Your body's resistance, and this is why electricity is really critical and, and, and the safety features. So in, I'm going to keep, keep things really simple for you. So all your cable should basically look like that, or it's buried in the wall, or it's underneath the floorboards, or it's above your ceiling. So all this grey twin and earth stuff hidden throughout your property, which is fine because it's got two levels of protection on it. The main issue is this. So if an electrician sees any of the internal colours, or any local authority saw the internal calls, they know that that's unsatisfactory from a condition point of view, because you've only got one level of protection from electric shock. And as you can see here, it doesn't take a great deal to kill you. So everything technically within your house could kill you from electric shock, because they reckon if you round it up and call it 0.1 amp, all that can be extreme pain, respiratory arrest. So it can all kill you. So... Anything where you've got single insulated cables is unsatisfactory and anything where you can touch a live exposed cable could definitely kill you. So that's where you drop into C1. That's as dangerous as it gets. C1s are basically, I can get a shock and therefore die, potentially, or the house is on fire. That's how bad C1s are. So I'm going to show you a couple of problems. So the problem with the human body is it only generates about quarter, half an amp of resistance from electricity point of view. So even things like your basic circuit breakers at home, even you lighting one, you're waiting for it to break at a six amp breaker. Okay. So you electricity throwing flowing through you back down to earth again isn't going to blow that breaker. Now I'm going to pre-warn you so you can look away because there's a couple of gory photos. The first one's not too bad. It's somebody has got an electric shock, and you'll see burns on the hand generally and burns on the feet where it goes through to earth. So I'm going to show you now and then I'll pre-warn you about the next one. So you see this type of thing that goes on and it's you know, everybody, some of you have probably had electric shocks and you go, well, I haven't got that on there. And I've had electric shocks as well. And I haven't got that on there. But I've seen people who have had this type of burn mark on them as well from electric shock as well. From, I've seen somebody with that with a 13 amp plug within their own home as well. So it, it can be done. It's just look, you know, look at the drawer sometimes. So the next photo is a bit more gory. This is a child who put their finger into a bedside table lamp in a landlord property down on the South Coast. There was no light bulb in the bedside table lamp and the bedside table lamp was not on the plug. It'd been hardwired into the back of a socket outlet. Now, a socket outlet is generally protected by a 32 amp breaker. So there's no way this child putting their finger into a bedside table lamp would ever blow that breaker. So this is what it looks like, just to pre-warn you now. So quite nasty, isn't it? And that's just from a bedside table lamp. So anybody who doesn't want to look it's now safe. OK, so I've, I've turned off. So we've got wiring regulations generally to try and make things safer. They are constantly changing. Uh, the changing for, you know, primarily three main reasons. One is uh, electrical safety for yourselves. So your own personal safety. What sometimes about fire safety as well. And the third one is generally changing technology. They make minor changes in between that. But they're the three main drivers to drive regulatory change. Um, they cover everything. So local authorities asked me to set, talk about minor electrical installation work. So from a you submitting that in as part of your licensing, that, you know, hopefully they'll agree with, that wouldn't be acceptable as an EICR. It isn't an EICR. An EICR is a report about me looking at all, generally all your installation and the condition of all your installation and the cables within that installation. 
And my electrical installation works is just about I've installed something. So I've done one circuit within your property or here I've altered or extended one circuit in your property. That's all it's saying. It's not passing comments on the other 90% for argument's sake in your property. Same goes for electrical installation certificate. Um, and funnily enough, I had a question yesterday sent to me on email by a London authority asking the landlord at this property had got a, a, an electrical installation certificate for a brand new consumer unit. And when they went and visited, they were seeing single insulated cables around the property. And my argument is there that the electrician's done a quick and dirty job where he's come in, he's changed the consumer, but he's not looked at any other parts of the property. And that's the issue with insulation certificates. It doesn't ask them to look at other parts of the property. Testing, yes, but they may not have seen it or they've seen it and chose to ignore it. So your issue with insulation certificates is it, they may do a, che a cheap, not cheap, but a quick version and just do the installation and not worry about the existing faults in your property just so you can get a certificate, which isn't the right way to go about it. So electrical installation condition report is more about, it's my opinion on the day that I visit your property based upon how much we agree to inspect and test. And ideally you want to test all the circuits within your property and inspect a certain level of percentage of all the accessories. And when I say inspect, I mean, you're taking these things off, you're looking behind it, you've got your screwdriver, you're making sure all the connections are tight. And if they are tight, that's fine. You don't need to worry about others because loose connections are going to give you bad test results. So EICR is about the condition of your property today based upon how much we agree to inspect and test. And the local authorities are all looking out for how much are they inspect and test it. If they're only doing 10%, which a lot of landlords did historically, then they know that 90% of the installation hasn't been checked, isn't stated that it's safe, because that's all that we're going to state, get to at some point, say satisfactory or it's a safe installation or unsatisfactory, it's an unsafe installation in simple terms to yourself so you understand. So that's what an EICR is about. You should be familiar with them by now as well. And hopefully the next time they come round, they'll be a, a bit more familiar to yourselves again, especially if you're in the PRS and this is your first time. I'm going to pre-warn you now about a couple of things that are out there and that local authorities do know to look out for this green paperwork, because it basically means that you can buy it off the NIC website. They're designed originally for them to practice on and learn how to do EICR reports. But this is about people who aren't ready to the competent person. It says these reports are used by NIC contractors and installers working outside their scope of registration. So the NIC are saying we don't recognize them as doing EICR reports. So be a bit wary about anything on a green report. They may not be competent to carry out the work. So there are certain things that you can do for yourselves, you know, from an inspection point of view to make sure your house is all right. You, you want to see if you've got green, yellow cables coming into where the power comes into your house, which means is that is the house earth? Any faults would always go back down to earth because if they're not going back down to earth and you touch the fault, guess what? It goes through you back down to earth that way. So you'd rather have it go through these nice big fat pieces of copper cable back down to earth and causes your circuit breakers to trip out in quicker times rather than through you. Now, one of the interesting ones is I always get is around how do I bypass a meter or what should I look for when I'm bypassing the meter? So if you really or if you want to know what to look for, and obviously I'm not teaching you what to do, you're looking for some type of connection between goes between the supplier life and the consumer life, which is one and four. And you can see here, this one's being jumped across. Now, the reason for, that you need to be concerned about this is, is for two reasons. Obviously, it's fraudulent, and then we end up all paying for it. And secondly, is because it will potentially cause a fire in your property. Because if you think about these nice, big, fat tails, uh, which are consu consumer unit tails, being generally 16 or 25 million most people's properties, you put a bypass in, a bit like this one, where they use a smaller size cable, well, all the power is running now through that smaller size cable. And over time, or at peak power, it'll start to really get hot. And eventually, at some point, it will catch fire. And what most of these, especially that top one that I showed you, that will be a loose connection. And when you've got loose connection, you've got you've got friction. So imagine like running your hands, electricity is running through that, it gets warmer and warmer. So the more current that flows through it, the hotter it will get. And that's where your fire will start in your property. Um, really obvious stuff that you can do for yourselves. I know I'm showing you an old consumer just in case you've got it, but the same principle will apply in a 
and you consume it like this. So if there's a blank missing out of here, you can buy I blanks. Sure I understand. You can buy blanks for about a pound in a, in a strip. They snap off, they fill the holes in. Because technically, if I was to put my finger in there and touch those two conductors, I'm, I'll be touching the main fuse on the house. Your main fuse will be 60, 80, 100 amp and takes up to five seconds to blow. And um, if you don't fall off it, you'll probably die from it. It's that extreme. That's how dangerous that is. So these type of old consumers or any blank system consumer will always be a C1 condition. It's as dangerous as it gets electrically within your properties. Consumer, it's an RCDs. And the, now the, uh, the regulations are pushed over a number of years to get RCDs included. And they've migrated from the black writing, what the old regulations are, into the blue, which is where the 18th edition started to put another requirement on it, up to the brown writing, which is the latest re requirement on the Amendment 2 regulations, which came out in September last year. So basically, any circuit now, if you've got ordinary people, which is technically me and you, living in these properties, they need to have RCD protection on it. Now, that won't get picked up until the next DICR. OK, so at the moment, if you don't have it in, fine. But the next EICRs, it will get picked up and it will be required to go in. So EI, so RCD protection to the circuits. Because uh, RCDs are lifesavers. So and I've said to you before, Linda, 100 milliamps can kill you. RCDs, even these type of things, all trip out at 30 milliamps. So... You'll get a painful shock, but you'll survive. And that's the big difference between circuit breakers, which are like these type of things in your boards, which just are only really designed to protect cables and all this type of thing, which is designed to protect you and your tenants as well. So these stop people getting accidental electric shock, or in, in some cases, deliberate electric shocks. So RCDs or RCBOs are the, are the way forward and have been pushed into the regs for a number of years now. So RCD protection on everything. Oh. Now, we've got some new stuff that's coming, and, and it's, it's not new in, in reality, but it's been introduced more and more frequently into the regulations, and some of the things have got stronger and stronger over the years as in the requirements. So originally, surge protection was very much down to the commercial side, so banking, local authority buildings, supermarkets, that type of thing, schools, universities. But they started to include down here residential tower blocks and larger HMOs. And what they've done recently in the latest edition is add a new requirement. So you've got here domestic insulation with mains fed smoke alarms supplied via a consumer unit. So any mains fed smoke alarm now requires surge protection as well. So at your next, again, at your next DICR, they'll, they'll start wanting to push surge protection onto property. And this stops electrical faults from either overhead currents, over, overhead strikes of the electric cable, or if you live close to commercial centers, and you get a, a buildup of voltage and they dump the voltage onto the network and you get a surge into your property. If you've got battery, if you're running a really basic PRS property where you've got an upstairs smoke alarm battery fed, downstairs smoke alarm battery fed, it won't affect you. It's only when it's mains fed smoke alarms or mains fed uh, fire systems as well. All that needs surge protection to protect that circuit, to protect you protecting people within the property. And, and that's what they look like. So I'm a bit of a fan of the orange ones because they stand out within the board. They're really simple to see. And it's really simple. These things are either working or they're not working. If they're not working, it generally means that they've been hit by a few strikes. Uh, you'll see them being green, which means they're healthy, or if they're red, they're damaged. It's as simple as that. But they should last a long time anyway. And then we've got this type of thing which has been introduced. Uh, and this is sort of like a, a follow on effect from what's happened at Grenfell, where these were introduced a long time ago, arc fault detection device, but nobody really bought them because they were dealing with arcing. So, you know, where two conductors aren't connecting correctly and an arc appears between the two conductors. Um, when the regulations were talking about including it in a bit more force, they moved away. So I've, what I've done is capture some of the prices during this process where it was talked about going into Amendment 2. And you can see there, 155 quid an item. And it's for all socket outlets, okay, in high-risk residential buildings or purpose-built student accommodation or HMOs. So these were the prices. It then dropped down to this price. And if you check CF these days, you can probably pick them up for 80 pounds. But again, 
this will get picked up at the next EICR. So it's, you don't have to run away and do it now because these are new regulations, but it will get picked up on the next EICR that's carried out. So you may have to look at this type of thing. And hopefully by then, because it'll be a few more years time, won't it, for quite a few of you, um, the prices will have dropped again. RCDs and metal consumers were all very expensive when they first were brought out into the regulations and eventually they've just reduced down in price over the years. In fact, so much so that metal is now cheaper than what you can buy plastic ones for. So, yeah, slightly different variations. So you can get one unit to protect all these circuits in the property so they can be wired up a different way depending on how much space you've got on the board. So just need to consult with the electrician at that point, see what you can get away with. So hopefully you've got metal consumer units installed. These were a main driver from a safety point of view because um, in fact, one of the folks I was gonna show you is from Oxford from a number of years ago, me doing a training session in there, uh, designed to stop the spread of fire around the property. Now, that doesn't mean that because you've got a plastic consumer unit, you have to change it. You don't have to change it no matter where it's positioned in your property, as long as it's showing no signs of thermal damage within the unit. Because when the electrician comes and redoes your EICR, he tightens up all the connections and therefore makes it safe again for another five years. So all this type of thing is what London Fire Brigade reported way back before 2016, seeing all these fires in residential and rental properties around London. They drove the uh, reason why we need to change it into metal because plastic would allow this type of thing to spread around the property. Your metal ones will still burn but at least it'll be contained within the box and at least it gives them time for the firefighters to get out and then fight the fire. That's all it's about. Um, and that one, funnily enough, was one that was given to me. You can see what the date on it. That was given to me. I hope this landlord isn't on the course uh, from Oxford City Council many years um, from a, a landlord, I think at the time, trying to do his own electrical work, left a loose connection, plastic consuming it, and it caught on fire. And again, it can be it can happen really quick and the electricians can be blamed for it. So we used to um, inspections for a large kitchen company. I won't say who, but that screw there had been left slightly loose. And look what happened over the weekend. So it can happen really quick in electrical fire because of loose resist because of resistance and loose connections. Earth in the bonding is how am I doing for time, by the way, Catherine? Yeah, you're good. OK, um, earth and bonding is one that you can do for yourselves. It's what I make most local local authority people do on the course. Um, you're looking for earth in, within your property. If you don't have it, you know you've got an issue within the property. So this would be normally attached to around you, where your stop tap is and around where your gas meter is. So those are two visible checks that you can do for yourself. If it's missing, you'll need to call an electrician out because you'll need to install it onto the property. And if you don't have it installed, if you wait for the next EICR, You'll get an unsatisfactory report and you'll have to install it at that point as well. So you might as well preempt some of this and see what you can do for yourself. See if you can see it. Because if you're looking at that type of thing where you can't see a bond on it, then you're going to have to have it bonded. Now, this is this regulation is a, a strengthening of the regulations when it first came out. And this was to do with some fires um, around the south coast as well where a couple of firefighters, I think in London and in Southampton, got caught in a fire. Um, there was a suspender ceiling above them. All the cables have been left on top of the suspender ceilings rather than all clipped. And what happens, the suspender ceiling collapsed in the fire, the cables got trapped around them and they died within the fire. So the regulations went, well, actually all the electric cables now need to be metal clipped if they're in an escape zone. Okay, they've removed the electrical cables now. So this is one that you can do for yourself. All cables need to be clipped in an escape zone or a long run of cables. So even if it's in plastic conduit, you have to take the plastic conduit off, fit these fire um, safety clips. They basically screw into the wall. You put a screw into it. You put your cable back on and then you fold it around. And that's your metal support during a fire. So if everything caught fire because plastic will burn easier rather than metal, it will all collapse. But at least the cable and the metal bit will be held in place. And if you want to know a distance to do it, roughly you're talking about half a metre to a metre at worst case scenario, depending on the weight of the cable. So if you've got long runs of cable, so this is so what I mean by cable, I mean telephone, satellite, aerial leads, data cables, all those need to be metal clipped if they're running in, for argument's sake, the hallway or the stairwell, because that will be the escape zone in most properties, won't it? There are other ones in out there, but you can decide. And if you've got long runs of cable, 
or cables running across doorways, they need to be metal clipped as well, even if they're in conduit. If it's hidden behind a wall, like that socket there, you don't have to worry about it. It's in the plaster. Plaster is, is the fire barrier anyway for any room, like a, a plaster wall ceiling. That's the fire barrier anyway. So you don't need to worry about it. It's all the surface mounted stuff you need to be concerned with. And you can do that for yourselves if you, fa if you fancy doing drilling walls and doing it. So EICRs, uh, but like it says, very much in about an opinion on what electrical, what the electrical condition is of the property. The regulations were based upon what we already had within this, uh, within the within the regulations anyway, from an electrical point of view. So we always used to refer to guidance note three for inspection and testing. And you can see here, domestic accommodation, you asked any electrician before, they would have quoted every five years. HMOs every five years, just in line with the regulations that you're familiar with these days. And a lot of properties are five years when it comes to commercial things, because it's a commercial business that you're running now. Um, and other areas will, you know, if there's an increased risk, they'll reduce the time frames. You might get reduced time frames on your EICRs, but the, for me, they've got to be for a justifiable reason. So things that electricians have found rather than I feel like it needs a new a new EICR report in two years' time. If you if you're all passing and all your test results are good, it should be the next five years. So we've got these codes C1 danger present. That's basically if I can get my finger into anything electrically C1. If I can see copper exposed C1. If anything smells of burning or is on fire, C1. They're all really obvious things, aren't you? C2 would be, um, this one's got evidence of burning on it. That would be C2 because there's no, it's not currently being used. So it'd still be C2. If there's any cracks on anything, C2. If there's anywhere I can see the single insulated cables, C2. All those type of things are C2. Overloading circuits, C2. All that type of thing. And C3s are all the things that, uh, electricians would like to do for you to make your properties safer, which aren't a requirement, aren't a safety concern. So the classic one would be you've got on your bond into your gas and water, ideally today it would be 10 mil. If you've got six mil, they'll pay, they'll say, well, you've, at least you've got bonding in place, but we could improve it. C3 improvement recommended if it was six mil bond. You don't have to do it unless you had any more power work done in your house, then they would be forced to do it because it's working in line with the new regulations then. And the further investigation is a, a bit of a complicated one. So it's basically electricians found a fault, can't identify where that fault is in, in, the, in your property. So it requires further investigation to find it. But if you get C1, C2 or FI, you're gonna get an unsatisfactory report. The classic FI is what they call a broken ring main where you've got the sockets were all, all connected together in a, in a big loop, shall we say, and that loop isn't isn't bro is isn't consistent. There's a break in it somewhere. Who knows where that break is? So it goes further investigation. So a few photos to share with you from various local authority courses I've done over the over the years. This one was a tenant attempting to bypass a meter. As you can see, didn't know what they were doing. Put the live cable back in. Didn't tighten up. And look at that fire that they caused because of it. Again, no bonding or bonding in place or bonding there but not connected in so that one there there's no bonding so you can see no green yellow cables c2 that one isn't attached onto the pipe again it's not in place c2 and this one on the top here is bonded on the supply side not your side it should be bonded on your pipe work so that needs disconnecting so that would be c2 as well this type of thing you can do for yourselves i'm going to show you some forms very shortly about you what you can do for yourself on the yearly inspection process um you'll be surprised these are free as well so you know they can you can use them as many times as you want and it's about you maintaining uh, records of the installation because i'm not sure if you noticed when it talks about maximum time frames it was five yearly period five yearly period you've also got change of tenancy in there just in case they did do and you've also got a minimum uh, routine subcheck as well. So what I'm talking about is you can do for yourself the routine subcheck on a yearly basis. And you can also do a tenancy check as well, just to make sure nothing's been damaged by them accidentally or maliciously. And nobody's added more sockets on. So if your EICR report says downstairs, there are 10 sockets and you go in and you, you count round and it's like, I don't recognize that socket. Then if I was you, I'd be calling an electrician out to make sure that's been done correctly. OK. But everything else, if it looks exactly the same, it feels the same and, and it is the same, then you can do your yearly checks for yourselves. And this is about just making sure it is in still good working order, like the tenant you gave it to the tenant and how the electrician left it on the report as well. So this type of stuff is about tenants 
building up rubbish around consumers. They like a bit of free air. That would only be a C3 improvement recommended. And the improvement is, well, let's clear all the rubbish away. Again, if somebody's bypassing a meter, uh, sorry, not bypassing a meter, bypassing the fuse, you want to be concerned about that because that would there would be a live part. So that's a C1 condition. And also from your perspective, has it damaged my cable? Has it damaged the cable? Has it overloaded the cable and caused damage to the cable? So if I was you, I'd get that cable inspected as well. And as I said, RCD protection is the way forward on most circuits these days, if not all circuits. There are a couple of exceptions in the commercial world, but domestically, it should all be RCD protected. And any new circuits that's worked on has to have RCD protection on it. So you can see how they want to strengthen, strengthen the level of protection for your cells and any tenant living in that property. So that's the ideal way. And this is how some of the tenants around London decide, sorry, not tenants, this is how a, a, land, a landlord around London decided to do it. So this was his attempt in non-waterproof cable into a live exposed RCD unit for a non-waterproof outdoor socket above the gas meter. So you can see what local authorities deal with. I know you're all on the course, so which means that Generally, that means that you're all good landlords trying to do the right thing. These are the people who avoid local authorities, and they're the ones that I generally see more of than the good ones, because the good ones are, aren't very interesting, are they? But that's what goes on, and that's why landlords sometimes get a bad reputation. This type of thing, technically, it's cracked. That would be a C1 condition. You can do that for yourself if you wanted to, if you saw it, you, if you, as long as you feel comfortable, as long as you can switch it off, it's a like for like, you will be allowed to do that but please make sure it's switched off. If you've got solar, please switch off the solar as well, just in case you've got that, because that would give a live feed into the property as well, potentially. And if you're not sure, just don't bother doing it, okay. Again, this is not how you repair it. Uh, seller tape, electrical tape is never mentioned anywhere within the wiring regulations. They generally like things with two screws fitted to the wall so they don't move. Uh, but that's not how you do it. Now this one is, this one's always an interesting one for me because this is always about, there's a, there was a story behind this. It was about tenants causing you issues. So when this was originally inspected, it was given a satisfactory report, but you're thinking, you're looking at the socket behind the hob and you're thinking, well, that could get damaged. And I'm with you, I agree with you wholeheartedly. If I saw that, I'd give you a C2 condition for that socket outlet. If the socket was damaged, I even go to a C1 condition as well. So. The reason for it is because when the tenant moved into the property, and this is why it's good for you to do a yearly inspection, this oven was here where the fridge was, and the fridge was in front of the socket, and the electrician who did the inspection swore blind that was the, con that was the condition. Because actually, there are clearance zones for metal and gas, sorry, for electric and gas hobs against things that are combustible as well. So have a look, see what the tenants are doing in the property, and that's why it's in I'm going to encourage you to do yearly inspection. Again, because you might pick up all this, you might pick up overuse as your socket outlets, which probably says to me there aren't enough sockets in the property. I hate these multi-way adapters. Uh, they can be quite dangerous, especially if they're unfused. Extension reels, reels, if they're left wound up, get really hot as well, especially if they're overloaded. So just be a bit mindful about extensions that are being used as well. Look, be concerned with things that either cook things or heat things, because they're going to be the heavy wattage items. Again, if you're interested in pat testing, if you want to become a pat test yourself, sounds like I'm selling myself now. Um, I run an NRLA uh, pat testing course where you can learn to pat test your own equipment. Um, there's an awful lot of stuff that you should be pat testing, would you believe? Um, we'll answer those questions later if anybody's interested. Now, sometimes this photo says to me, is the perfect example around, sometimes you look at photos and you think, well, that looks all really new. It's all nice and neat. It's all a fairly new installation. It's all got nice green yellow cables in it for the earth in all separate meters. Thank you. Sorry. All nicely tagged and sealed, nice tails. And then sometimes you just don't realize the obvious things that are staring you in your face when you've got somebody who's decides not bother putting a plug in it. They put a screwdriver in the earth, open the earth up so they can feed alive and a neutral in just to run some something off it. So all this stuff that's really heavy voltage, all nice and safe and you're well protected from it. And look at that one thing that could kill you down there. So it's always good to show you why sometimes if you don't feel confident, you shouldn't be doing your own electrical work. So I'm not sure if you can pick the fault, obvious faults here where it's been not connected back into the back box. It's been fitted upside down. 
you can get your finger in there. Certainly, child could get their finger in there. That would be a C1 condition. Uh, modification of existing units, very clever, very ingenious. But again, you've got C1s and C2s in there. It, would, it wouldn't be satisfactory, that. Again, another tenant, a landlord down at London got a satisfactory report on their property, and then they start to, I'll, I'll have a go, doing some external lighting. Uh, this is all outdoors, by the way. Um, it's not a conservatory. That is not an external light. That is not external cable. Those are single insulators, so you're into C2s. That is a live chop block, which is a C1, and that cable runs across the escape zone, which you can see isn't metal clipped. And again, that would be a C2 condition if you're going to pick fault with every single thing along the way. And sometimes in certain parts of the country, that's how properties have been lived in when uh, local authorities inspect it. So you can see why, you know, I would say generally say that's not safe. I hope you agree that with me that you think that's not safe. Uh, and again, landlords get very ingenious about how to create lighting rather than use the lighting circuit here. Let's no, let's not bother with that. We'll just run a socket down here, which is live, and we'll just hang the lighting off the cable because that's the way to do it, isn't it? And then people get really clever with things. So this was a, a North London authority. Uh, that is a shower on the door. That is the live cable there. And as soon as you open that door, the live cable and the shower are inside the shower with you as well. So I doubt many of you would be volunteer to have a shower with a live cable, would you? So you see everything. And again, just to emphasize, if you don't want to do it yourself, which I'm probably going to encourage you not to do, please use somebody's registered because at least if that way they've left you in a terrible condition like this one, you can go back to their compter person scheme and they will force them plus all they've got insurance on the back of it. They will force them to correct it. This is what happens when you deal with non-registered electricians and it was left like this. You would not believe the condition of that, would you? That is all live in there as well. And even I've just only just noticed that those tails are a bit stretched as well. So we've got just to wrap up, home safety guidance documents. Now, these cover a number of things that you can do for yourself. Now, it's a simple tick or fail exercise. As in, I'll give you an example, smoke alarms, are the batteries still working? Have you pressed the test button on it? That type of thing. Have you dusted them as well? Because they tend to get blocked, a bit blocked up with dusters, uh, with dust as well in the sensors. Do you have carbon monoxide now in any room that burns gas? You know, which is a new requirement, isn't it? And then we've got down here, visual electrical checklist. The website is called Home Safety Guidance. These are all PDF forms. They've got other things in there for you to look at as well. So fire escape strategies written by the insurance sector, full prevention list, again, written by the insurance sector that you pay for. Um, and they're all free to use as well. And they're all free to download as many times as you want. And at least that way, you are maintaining records on your property as well, which makes the local authority very happy because you've now got your EICR in place or any electrical certificates that you've had done in place. And now you're doing a yearly inspection on your property as well, just to say this property is perfect. And that will that will cover you from insurance perspective fully, won't it? The amount of landlords I've seen doing NRLA courses with me, where they've had, let's say, an electrical fire within the property and the insurance company have gone, let me see your gas safety certificate, let me see your EICR on the property, and can you prove that you're pack testing as well? because it may be an insurance requirement, okay? And it's always worth reading the small print, isn't it, just to make sure it is, because technically they'll see it as a commercial business and therefore you're required to pat test. Okay, there we go, Catherine. Was that on time? Was that under time, over time? Is that enough for you? I suppose we've got plenty of time for questions, haven't we? Um, yeah, so thank you very much. So yeah, um, any questions? So. Um, please just either pop them in the chat or um, unmute yourselves, put your camera on and ask. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you. I probably scared everybody to death. Hi, good morning. Morning. Hi. Morning. Um, I'd be interested in um, doing your pat testing course. <laughs> I shouldn't really be on here selling that. It's I know, but um, I'd be interested in doing that if, uh, okay. if there's one available. So um, go on the NRLA website, and that's who, that's who we'll do it for. NRL. NRLA. Yeah. 
So one, sorry, sorry, Catherine, one day course, teach you how to pat test, and then you can do all your pat testing you want afterwards. You'll obviously have to buy a piece of pat testing equipment afterwards, um, but you'll be set up for life then. Is that a .co.uk? Probably. I don't see what. Dot org, I think. Ah, uh, okay, maybe. Clearly NRLA, don't you'll find it. As soon as you put NRLA, you'll, it'll pop up. It'll, it'll be, pop up. Yeah, it's the, cool. the amalgamation of the RLA and the NLA, isn't it, these days? Most, yeah. probably quite a few of the landlords on here remembers. She'll do that. Thanks very much. Okay. It's a very practical course as well, so it's lots of hands-on doing pat testing. Uh, so there's a question on the chat about pat testing okay. annually. Um, do you hmm. need to do the tenants' appliances or just your own, the landlord's Only, appliances? That would so, be. There are some simple things to avoid pat testing. The, the obvious one is don't supply any equipment. Now, unfortunately, that gets difficult because you've got some apply some equipment in your property you may not even thought about being appliances. So any so a cooker, for argument's sake, is a fixed appliance. Wash machines, dishwashers, all these type of fridges. Now, the nice thing about that is because they're classed as fixed appliances, they're not likely to move. And therefore, this cable, well, not this one, but a flex for argument's sake, because it's not moving around all the time, it's unlikely to get damaged. So anything that's portable or handheld generally moves a lot more and therefore you, you have to test it more often. Now, your fixed equipment, including, here we go, this will upset a lot of people, your gas boilers, all need to be tested i would say on every, every five years so it's not a massive requirement and you probably if you want to get it done at the same time you have your eicr done but what you should do is ask for an pat testing report okay okay thank you um so jonathan crooks has his hand up so we'll come to jonathan um hi there um can you hear me okay yeah fine yeah okay great yeah so i've got a question about you were talking about the um smoke alarm sensors mains powered and spds so yeah I, I don't know exactly how my smoke alarm sensors have been wired into mains but i presume they just use the the main circuit that sits under the floor just use but, the lighting circuit normally so that, that circuit's already on a uh, rcd fuse i guess um but is it is it just norm is it a simple thing just to swap that's fairly standard RCD. No, you, you keep you keep that protection on that circuit because that's yeah. that's about personal protection. And somebody getting a shock off that circuit. What you have to add to the to your consumer unit is a surge protection device. So it's a, another actual device. Then protects. The nice thing about it is then protects everything within the property. So if oh, any so you do it on the main, the incoming, the main. Incoming yeah, that's right. Like so any surgeon right. come in and come in, you know, down the cables, the main tail to come into your house. What yeah. you'll do is you'll loop it then into the surge. The surge will pick it up and yeah. it goes through the surge protection and then goes along the earth cable and get and the surge gets dumped onto the earth network. Okay, great. So rather than around your house, it gets dumped somewhere else. Okay, fantastic. I was worried that we might simple have to terms, get anyway, the whole thing rewired. So yeah, no, no, not at all. No. Okay, so it's, you just did for the house. Great. Thank you. And you can pick them up these days for about thirty pounds as well. Yeah, yeah. I just googled them, so not too bad. All right, great. So yeah, there we go. You can buy dear ones, depending on your manufacturer. If you really want to, you can go up and spend a lot of money on Hager and Schneider stuff, 80 quid a go. But the surge stuff is like, I think it's 30 quid I'll buy it for in a pack. Well, I'll get the electrician to sort yeah. that one out. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, we've just got a couple of other questions in the chat. So we'll be sending out um, our own slides after the event. I'll speak to Ian about uh, getting his slides sent out and we are recording okay um we'll also share the uriel's the home safety guidance as well we'll send those to you on email after the session um we've got a question from one of the agents their electricians say we need to change the plastic consumer unit and that's mandatory for an eicr is that correct i would say sh show me where it says it's mandatory so no it's not correct in fact so much so I'm going to quote you now out of a book that's been published by NAPIT on EICRs. I'm going to read to you the worst case scenario you can have for a consumer unit. If I can find it very quickly. Come on. It's basically talks about, here we go. So worst case scenario, 
a consumer in a domestic household premise is not metal or installed in a non-combustible cabinet, which some local authorities require them to do, uh, showing no signs of thermal damage located under a wooden or combustible public stairwell forming part of an escape route from a dwelling. So you've got a plastic consumer underneath your wooden stairs or it's in an escape zone and they put that down as a, this is the worst case you can have, C3 improvement recommended. Now, there are, there's a key thing there to understand. It says no signs of thermal damage, just like I've said. So if the, on your EICR, they open up the EICR unit and they find that there's thermal damage within the EICR, then you're forced to change it because there's now evidence of thermal damage fire. But existing stuff, no, you don't need to change it. It's plastic. It's absolutely fine. And the most important thing is to stop thermal damage is you do your EICRs every five years and the electrician comes along with a torque screwdriver for doing it correctly and tightens up every single connection in that to the correct torque and therefore it's not getting loose and therefore you're not getting friction. Okay, so, thank Sorry, you. I need, now need to step off my soapbox so that room really winds me up. <laughs> um, so we've got a question about fixed appliances being tested every five years. So yeah. if... If the appliances are, are fixed, they're wired into the main electrical system, then they yep. will be part of the EICR. No. No. So anything that, simple in simple terms, from a, an appliance point of view, if it has a flex to it, it's, part, it's clusters. So I'm going to show you the book now. So everybody gets confused and everybody calls it PAP testing. But in reality, it's that. It's in-service inspection and testing of electrical equipment. It never says PAP, just PAP was always the easiest way to refer to it. So it's not portable. There are loads of things in there. There are like computer banks in there because they're classed as stationary equipment, bending machines, hand dryers, all that type of thing. Cookers dependent because dependent, a cooker has a flex on it, which goes to a cooker control point. That is still an appliance. Your gas boiler has a flex on it, goes to a fuse spur normally. That is an appliance as well. And it is detailed in there as an appliance as well. It's just classed as a fixed one. It, generally, you think about it, the flex isn't going to get damaged, is it, in reality, because it's not going to move that much. So what you're trying to do when you do a pat testing is you're making sure that things aren't getting damaged because if you plug things all the time, you've got you, somebody could stand, stand on the plug, the plug could get damaged, the plug could get pulled, you know, the flex is getting twisted, whatever. So all those type of things need inspecting more often. But you think about it you probably never noticed the flex on your boiler so that's why it's every five years and the five years just to say yes it's still in good condition the boiler hasn't created a fault so that's overloading the cable for argument's sake okay um so yeah the one of the agents whether the council agree the fixed appliances should be tested for every five years and it's going to come down to the appliance and when it's located mm. and the judgment um yeah, there's some obviously in change of tenancy. If you're going in and doing your check and see it hasn't been moved, then that will be okay. And it's yeah, maybe every five years you do the bigger ones. That that'd be fine. Yeah, appliances aren't going to move every five years. And there's guidance out there from the health and safety executive for about pat testing low risk environments. Now I'm happy to send that to you, Catherine, and you can share that as well. And okay. they will state every five years or well. so. It's not my opinion. It's like this is what the industry have agreed. Okay, we've got quite a few. Because in, in this, it will talk about risk rating. There's a risk calculation and a risk matrix for it. But in reality, just follow some simple guidance. Good. So we've got quite a few questions coming up on PAT testing. We'll send out the links that Ian has. Might be that this is actually a subject for a session as well. Okay. Um, we, in our license conditions, we don't give a frequency of PAP testing no. we just say that as landlords you have the responsibility to make that they are maintained and safe Correct. and it is up to you how to prove you do that obviously the port the appliance testing is one way of doing it you may want to do it annually mm -hmm. you might want to do it every two years whatever it is it's very much going to be dependent on that particular property correct so Jonathan, who's thinking now about, I think it was Jonathan, once it was now thinking about joining the NRA course, 
when he comes on the course, because he's he'll be a pat tester, I'm going to encourage him to do it on a yearly basis because he'll be doing his own rather than paying for it. Slightly different scenario. He's got the experience. He might as well do it. It's not a big job. But again, when it comes down to cost, just follow what the HSC could advise. And they'll talk about, it gets a bit complicated. You talk about different levels of appliances. So you draw, you're roughly talking between about one to three years for most things that move, and then five for things that don't move in simple terms. So I've just got a couple of more questions yep. in the chat. There's a couple of people um, talking about joining National Residents and Landlords Association and some landlords saying they're really good. We'll put the information out to you. We would encourage you to join a Landlords Association as well. Um, right. I'm not an employee of the NRLA. I just do a couple of training courses for them. <laughs> no, I'm not Ian. But even, I'm not, I'm even not as, the, tax on me. <laughs> um, as the council, they have a lot of resources that we can't yeah. provide and on lots of different subject matter. Um, we've got another question. Um, it's, so EU tenants coming with two pin plugs for kettles or TVs. Are they safe for use in the UK? So tenants bringing over equipment from overseas. OK, so if, if it's two pin appliance, it means it's just got a live and a neutral in it. So if they plug it into one of the three pin adapters, so one of the travel adapters and used over here, yes. Or the other option is uh, you cut it off and you put a new plug on it. Now, you don't really want to be doing that, but if they want to do it, as long as they know what they're doing. And in the health and safety guys, it tells them how to wire a plug up as well. So they can do that as well. So two um, pins is just, there's no earth on it. So the earth is only for something that's made of metal where you can touch it and you'll get a shock through it. So that's the only issue that we've got to be worried about. But again, you can pat test it and, true, and prove that it's okay afterwards as well. Thank you. So I've got one question left from Jackie in the chat. I might have to ask Jackie uh, to explain the question. She says she'd like clarification on what... Uh, regulations residential and commercial properties need to be tested to is it the latest set of regulations it is it's your prs regulations and your hmo regulations aren't they yeah. so prs yeah. regulations yeah. 2020 my, my question was in really if something if you've had something recently done in your property and then the new set of regulations come in do you have to have them immediately no. be done once, once the five-year report's over so give me give me an example. So you've had what have you had something done? When did you have something done? Well, it's a, it's a very general question actually because okay. I, I work for one of the Oxford colleges. But um, so if you have a sort of five year wiry inspection, yeah. um, I just wonder then a new set of regulations come in once that five year you know your five years has passed. Do you do you have to update entirely to that no. new set of regulations? No, I didn't think all. that was the case, but I feel no. that is. Sometimes what electricians will tell you is the case. Well, the classic examples just come up, up on this on this hunt it where the summary's forcing plastic consumers to be changed into metal. Well, that regulation was back in 2016. And I'm still yes. saying today you can still live with plastic consumers if you want. You're not forced to change it. And I, I've so quoted I you. The next question is where would you find the information to challenge um, un unnecessary works? So if you want to buy um, a book, that's not a bad book. Uh, Napit, you can buy it off Amazon. EICR Code Breaker book. It lists all the codes you'd find on an EICR, and you'll find in there different variations of consuming it. It'll get into the ones I've told you today. So if it generally ch if regulations change about trying to make things safer from a personal shock point of view or from a fire safety point of view, then they tend to get forced on you a bit because it's a bit of common sense, if I'm really honest with you. Uh, and sometimes that can be cheap. It can be, you know, not and and quite affordable. So most regulations you're not forced to do unless you have some type of power work. So any type of modification of the existing property. If you do that, then straight away you've got to bring the property up on the circuit you're working on and the general safety of the condition of the property up to the current regulations. Mm -hmm. That's it. That yeah. You're not working on the rest of it and therefore you're not responsible for the rest of it. Okay, I, th I think that has has clarified things a bit. Thanks, Ian. So if I came in, let's say, if I came in and you've got a property that's not been touched for twenty odd years, and I'm putting a I'm putting a so one socket outlet onto your property, so that's the ring main. Therefore, I've got to make sure the ring main's got a thirty two amp breaker on it, or a thirty two amp RCBO, which is an RCD and a breaker combined into one unit. And I'll probably say at this point, your tails may may need upgrading. 
if they're undersized, if they're undersized, but the bonding probably is undersized. So that would need changing. But if you've got a fairly newish property, hardly anything at all. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, okay, so somebody would just like to know the name of that book again. Oh, there you go. EICR Codebreaker. Okay. All right, got that on the screen. I know they sell it on, my, on Amazon. Got I, some... think, I think that is all the questions. Um, okay. I don't know if anybody has anything else. No, can't I can't get any more questions. So it's um, it's coming up to ten past eleven. So what I'm going to suggest is we'll have a short break and then come back at um, eleven twenty for the next session. And I just like to say thank you very much for Ian to coming along today. That's and good. I hope you all found that very informative. Um, and you can see why we asked him to come along because he, he's very enthusiastic about the topic. Um, and we'll be sending out the links afterwards. So what I'm just going to do is stop the recording and then um, we will have a break. <laughs>